want to go ahead and get started. Um, we, uh, what we've traditionally done in our conferences is because uh, we end up not having very much time for questions at the end. Uh, we like to have this uh, opportunity to ask <coughs> some questions now and to uh, allow some uh, questions from each panelist uh, toward the other panelists. So uh, this is a great opportunity to kind of extend that last session. Um, if, uh, if you'd like, we can ask you to do what we did last session and recap briefly, but since we're running behind, we probably want to keep that to a minimum. And, and uh, how, how do you feel, panelists? Do you want to recap a little bit of anything you said, or should we just plow into some questions? Okay, so questions from the audience. I'm going to be Mike Boy. So. Well, this is kind of a political question, and I didn't want to ask it earlier because we were talking about Mormons and Muslims. But with the recent uh, popular revolutions in, in the Middle East, um, what, what, what do you see as the future of these? Is democracy something that can work in, an, in a Muslim cultural context? Uh, here in the U.S., we come from a, a Protestant uh, religious context, which is highly decentralized. Uh, Mormons and Catholics have the hierarchy, and you'd think maybe monarchy and, and dictatorship would work here. But how is it in an Islamic culture where the, um, there is no central dictator of, 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 uh, of values and morals and, since the prophet, um, that the governmental form has historically been so often um, imperial monarchy and dictatorship. Uh, it would seem like the decentralization of the, on the religious sphere would make democracy something that would fit naturally into the culture. But it doesn't seem to have been the historical pattern. Would someone like to comment on that? <laughs> Well, uh, <clears throat> it is true that um, after the Prophet, uh, there have been uh, no central authority, but there have been, of course, uh, caliphate was there, and it continued in different forms and different ways. Um, but then came the colonial period, and the colonial period um, is the one that uh, we have the Muslim world chopped up into all different uh, groups, uh, different areas, some of them under the British, some under the French, some other, other groups. And then we have uh, the early 20th century uh, movements of independence. After the movements of independence, uh, the, you see that each country ended up with uh, um, different groups of authority that are there. So you have uh, smaller states and bigger states, whatever. But uh, the, the states uh, would not, did not come out, most of them, some of them did, some, but most of them did not come out as uh, uh, democratic states. As, uh, and so there have been some struggle between the people and, uh, and the governments. And, uh, this struggle has been going on for a long time. It's not something recent. Uh, it has just uh, recently it has emerged into a, a, a popular movement, as it happened in Egypt, as you saw that, as you saw that in Tunisia, or as you, you are seeing that in uh, in Libya. It is not based on any particular party or group, but it is just the people themselves. They would like to see freedom. They would like to see that they have some say in the government. Uh, so I hope that uh, this is going to move into the right direction and uh, the government will represent the people, not just uh, some group, some uh, parties will take over, but rather general populations and their views will emerge. But it's too early to say anything at this moment. Uh, uh, there is no centralized, uh, I mean, there is no party, <laughs> there is no is leadership that you can say that has is, is, is been there behind this whole movement that is uh, emerging now in different countries. 
uh, it is a, a general feeling. Uh, so it, it is going to take time, but I think the trend is right. Uh, that's that's very optimistic. The the, the feeling is there. This is the people see that uh, there is it it will come out into something hopefully positive. And uh, those who have done the study of Islam, they would realize that Islam is not against uh, democracy. Islam is not against the representative government. Actually, this is the basic teaching of Islam, uh, which we use the concept shura in Islam. And shura means consultation. So consultative government, uh, whatever way it is going to work out, it will be there that way. <clears throat> um, my question is um, about um, a question for, about Islam. Um, in Mormons, we believe that um, a moral agency is like a form of, of individuality that we have, that we are basically no, no, no. Uh, that we ha that well as Mormons we believe that there is um, a principle called moral agency that we follow, where we have freedom to choose and um, have. Um, control over our lives. Does Muslim have any doctrine that um, is similar to like um, uh, anything that has to do with free will or anything like that? Free will doctrine? Yeah, in, in Muslim, in Islam. Yes, I mean, free will is the essential uh, teaching in Islam that God has given human beings freedom. And uh, on the basis of that, there is the responsibility. Without freedom, there is no responsibility. So the people have, uh, and they, uh, I mean, they are, they are rules that have to be followed, but those who follow the rules, they follow the rules with their own freedom. So there is no compulsion in the matters of religion, the Quran teaches that. Uh, religion has to be exercised with free choice, and uh, with the one's own will, and on the basis of that, one will going to receive the reward or the punishment on the day of judgment. Yes, so it, it is there. But uh, it, this doesn't mean that because you are free that you choose whatever wha way you want to find, do that. So there are certain uh, directions that are given there. So Sharia gives direction. The Quran tells, gives the direction. What is halal and haram has been given, explained. Within that, you have to follow that. If I understood your question correctly, yeah. yeah. You know, there's a <clears throat> a conception out there that historically, though, that uh, the Prophet Muhammad uh, forced people by the sword to become Muslims. Uh, would you clarify the history behind that, and, and is that true, or 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 how does that mesh with the teachings of Islam? Never. I mean, there is no. S no statement in the Quran which says that people should be forced to accept Islam. Uh, the, actually, the opposite of that, the Quran says in a number of places that you cannot uh, compel people to become Muslim. There is no compulsion in the matters of religion. So it is, has to be f by free choice. And it is also, it is never said that you go and fight people or attack people because they are of different faith. I mean, uh, any, if anybody has any words, mention that, what words is there, which says that, that you go and fight people because their religion is different. No, if people have uh, attacked, you have a right to defend yourself. And actually there are two levels. One of them is personally, individually, if somebody attacks you. Individually, if somebody attacks you, the rule is that you forgive. You, um, if you forgive, it is better. Uh, that is, that's why you have to, uh, one place, woman afa wa aslaha fa ajru wa Allah. Those who forgive, those who overlook, they will receive the reward. But then there is a national security. There is the group, there is the, uh, the state, if, if that is attacked. And actually most of the wars and the battles that took place during the time of the Prophet were not of personal attack. When there was personal attack, people were forgiven. Prophet himself forgave many people. But when there was attack on the state of Medina, then he stood very strongly for that, to defend the state. 
and there the battle took place. So these are, should not be confused like the individual relationship, but rather most, mostly is the attack on the state, which was the, the required to, to defend the state, and, and only at that time the war was permitted. So meaning of jihad is not, of course jihad does not mean necessarily war, jihad means a struggle, but even in the context of qital or uh, actual warfare, the, the rule is that, that you should not start, you should not uh, begin the hostility. But if somebody, if, if there is hostility there, then you have a right you have to defend yourself. Interestingly enough, <laughs> there's a um, common misperception among anti-Mormons that early Mormons also forced people to become Mormon, which is an interesting sort of crossover, I think. Question regarding teaching of religion in the schools. Uh, the United States has become a very secular society. We find uh, increasingly fewer people involved in, uh, in religion, that is, uh, formal, formal religion. But on the other hand, still a large number of people feel that religion is important in their life. The question is, uh, are you optimistic or pessimistic? Now, if this is a, a factor in an American culture, are you optimistic or, or pessimistic as to the future of trying to acquaint our people with uh, different world religions? Yeah. Here's, here's what I have been saying, uh, and I don't mind saying now. And I, I say it not, not so much to give a pat on our back, but I say it because my experience tells me so. We Americans would do the right thing at the end of the day if somebody showed us the way. Meaning that I am optimistic for right reasons in terms of not hoping for, but my experience tells, us, tells me that our system allows us to find a way to correct the mistake that we may have made if we find out that was a mistake. So future, as far as future goes, I do believe that we as a nation who has all the ingredients necessary for us to create a society out there that we could perhaps contribute. We haven't taken our place at that particular table yet. Uh, but I do feel that we could if you wanted to because we have all the means necessary to deliver that hope. I hope I answered your question. Here, I've got a question. Um, I'm going to paint you just a little picture, just thinking um, if you view the history of the United States from its founding, you kind of see these liberal ideas popping up and movements that kind of accelerate the, um, the ideals and concepts of separation of church and state within the U.S. You know, you, you see how church gets out of the schools and, you know, kind of the boundaries that get to be set and how those build. And I, I was just thinking as, you know, as Islam is the fundamental of the Middle East and, and how it's so ingrained in everybody's um, concepts and ideals in that, in that region of the world, how do you view that politicians and people over there will kind of see this happen uh, you know, as they become more maybe democratic, as they view um, separation of church and state? How do you think those liberal ideals will be accepted as you know, church is taken away from school and church is taken out of government and, and that kind of that rift begins like it's happened here in the U.S. There's uh, no one way of separation of church and the state. It is not only that the, the, the only way is the United States way of separation of church and the state. They are, what is the objective of separation of church and the state? If the objective is considered, that the objective is that people, religious minorities, will, should have freedom to practice their religion, to organize their life so they can they pray the way they want to pray, they have their family life the way they want to have their family life. A uh, number of other rules are recognized. If that is the meaning, yes, it is, uh, it is accepted. It is within the Islamic principles. So uh, it could be a different way, different patterns of that. That, uh, uh, but the, the basic objectives, what we call it, the maqasid, eh, the objectives of that. The objective is the freedom of the people, freedom of the minorities, 
to live freely and practice freely and participate in the life of the uh, of, of of their country yes of course that 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 should be there that is there it's recognized how they are going to make the constitution how they are going to have the election how they are going to run the government there could be different ways of of doing that just like democracy there is no only one way of democracy there are many ways of democracy that are there so in a similar way i think this uh, idea this uh, goal that is there the freedom of the people freedom of the minority uh, people of different faith living together that must be there and that must be recognized i, I just want to add um i think when we ask those questions uh, as americans we should ask ourselves the questions we're asking about quote unquote the other is it based on what is it based on our own experiences our historical or based on our own narrative and contextualizing in that respect we're projecting our own perhaps part of the narrative on the other so the question that i would ask ourselves is that is this a reflection of my own experiences that issue of separation of church and state which is an american context do i know the historical aspect of it why that came about and what were the reasons for it do we know that do we know the other side that we have created as the other do we know why did we create that the other i mean we heard about the, the whole issue of orientalism this <coughs> orientalist occidental construct is strictly a western concept why is a question that i would ask why did we create this construct why did we create this construct these are the questions as americans we need to ask do we know i mean i shared with you the example of the religions uh, as to how they were covered i mean there are other aspect of it we do the research and the question that i always have come up with is that as americans what exactly do we know about the world and we tend to project our own historical narrative on the others we see through our own lenses how can they be democratic if you will well it took us several centuries to arrive where we are and it was a bloody history it was a huge price we paid in the process but the question that we should ask that do we know about their history most likely not we know that their religion was spread by sword where did that come from on and on i mean these are the questions we need to ask today that do i know anything about this the other that we have created as the other how can we deconstruct that yeah. for instance the issue of the of religion being spread by a sword that's that's an image we have of the way it was spread where uh, uh, as we get into it at least my experience in talking with muslims about their history that it was a whole i get a whole different view of of what uh, what took place and and what is the policy what was the practice and 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 in seeing that much of what islam gets blamed for is not islam but it's particular countries or particular cultures or particular rules established in a particular setting by the people and blamed on or given used islam is used as an excuse for it uh, or a justification for it when there's no foundation in the quran for for what's but, but what's Steve, being practiced. if you if you were to ask the root cause of where did that come from where did that image of spread by sword came we would find it is our source it's orientalist source is where we would find so the question is and i'm not asking a blame game let's play a blame game let's blame ourselves i'm not going there i'm simply asking let's find out the source of information where am i getting my information from and it will you you'll learn a great deal but just by asking those questions and by finding out that particular source of information where it has come from that in itself would be an educational experience worth looking into okay um <clears throat> kind of a follow up to that last question um i uh one of the things that i'm wondering if any of you have a concern about uh and i i hope i'm not 
um, feeding into that narrative uh, that you uh, talked about of the other. Um, but I, I am a little concerned. I, I have a friend in Egypt who is a Coptic Christian. And uh, one of the things that I'm concerned about is what if, I hope they get democracy. You know, I hope that's what happens and that the military doesn't just, you know, uh, prop up another dictator. But uh, let's assume they do get democracy, like I'm hoping. And uh, what if, uh, it, does it seem like a real possibility to any of you that there won't be sufficient protection for minority rights uh, in the country? That's my question. There is, uh, there has to be, I mean, uh, <laughs> the protection of the minorities, because that's essential for, uh, and this would emphasize even um, uh, the, the religious scholars there, Al-Azhar itself spoke about that, a number of other uh, authorities, they emphasize that point, that we are living together and I found it very moving uh, that uh, the Friday sermon that was given just two weeks ago, and the almost four million people came and they gathered to pray in the Tahrir Square. There, uh, the speaker uh, spoke to both. And he said, first time I'm doing that, uh, in, in, in my Friday sermon I was speaking, not only to Muslims, I'm speaking to Muslims and Copts together. That we are, uh, this is, uh, you are, we are all Egyptian. And we have to live in Egypt, we have to build Egypt together. I think this is the kind of a spirit that is, that is there. And that's why a, a week before that, when people are afraid that maybe some people from the regime will come and attack the people, cops, young people were standing holding hands and protecting the Muslims who were praying there, Friday prayer. So there is a, uh, there is a relationship. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are some small groups there. <coughs> Uh, it, it's terrible that those groups have done some, something. As recently, I was, I was reading that that there's some attacked each, uh, some some cops and, and and some Muslims and some cops were killed in that. But uh, this is a small group. I mean, you can see that in this situation, this movement that is happening there, s there are some wrongdoers. They will do wrong things. But majority of the people, what they are doing, they have a great feeling of b bonding and working together in that. And this is the, a good spirit, this is a good thing that is there. I hope this is the way they are going to work on that and build on that. Mm -hmm. So a society is going to come out where there will be not, uh, no, no oppression, no injustice done to any group. And I think the, what is interesting as far as my work goes, where I, I have an extensive travel that I have to do, um, and especially dealing with the 30-something professionals that I spend a lot of time in universities, uh, campuses around uh, mostly Europe and, and uh, Asia and Middle East. Uh, what I'm finding interesting enough with the, with the younger generation, first of all, they're asking the right questions. So the question number one they usually I get in my, uh, because I have a set of questions that I ask uh, when I'm sitting in the, in the, in the in the in the groups uh, where I do this, um, um, when I'm invited, where I, wherever I'm invited, is that they, their first acknowledgement is that we have become religiously illiterate, meaning we don't know the the concepts of our own faith, uh, and for different reasons. Where, without blaming anyone, where a colonial experience or what have you. And then the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, majority of part of my conversation with them is all about the civil society. I mean, case in point, I was just a couple of months ago, I was in Casablanca, and I was speaking to a university campus. That class happened to be uh, learning about the American uh, political system. And so they were quoting Benjamin Franklin and founding fathers. And it was like sitting at home, I mean, you know, talking to an American class. and. and and in some cases, I thought they, were, they knew more about the American political system than some of the, our, our average kids here. What was interesting about that is that I was able to communicate to them certain issues when it came to the certain concepts, that there were concepts that were clear to them. What was interesting about that the religious side of the equation was a weaker part of the equation. But the civil society side of the equation that I'm hearing from uh, my encounter in, uh, in uh, almost more than 14 countries in European side, 
where I sit with the young kids, what I'm hearing from them is that we understand the issues of religious freedom, religious pluralism, religious literacy. And that, to me, it gives me bigger hope from the younger generation of, uh, of Muslims. With all what's happening out there, what, all what has happened in the last 100 years or so, which is uh, we have arrived at a point where you saw what happened in Egypt and Tunisia. Happened because of the technology that really did something by equipping the young generations to do what otherwise they would not have been able to do. I mean, so I, I think what, what, what I'm, point I'm trying to make it is that when it comes to, for example, if I were to go out and talk to some of the kids here, same question I can ask, and I've done this uh, time and time again in dozens of countries, I cannot tell. I have to pinch myself, where exactly am I? Am I sitting in the, uh, the place of birth, Ahmedabad city where I was born in India? Or I was, I'm sitting in Islamabad, uh, a library of uh, students? Or am I sitting in Singapore, in Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur? Or am I sitting in Netherlands or Switzerland and or some of those uh, countries? I cannot tell the difference because the language they speak, the understanding that they have of the issues on the ground, and, and the way they look at the future. I, I see uh, almost all, no matter where I am, the young generation is on the same page with generations in different parts of the world. And so that gives me hope. I mean, I'm, I'm just giving you a sort of a, a experience that I have had that what kind of future democracy or what have you will happen there, all I can tell you is that what happened in those countries today where they want human dignity. 